Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from the CUNY TV Foundation, Capital One Bank, Genova Burns, Gian Tomasi and Webster, New York Community Bank, the Wickoff Group, m and Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, LLC, and These Friends. How does a, a kid who, who's born in Delhi, India, who once is a pre-med student, who, tr I mean, went to like nine different schools during high school, then goes to business school, the Rotary Club, comes to New York, uh, comes to New York originally and finds a place in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania to go to for his <laughs> master's. Then he's ready to get a job with Sylvania or selling, you know, insurance. But somebody says, kid, maybe banking is a good thing for you. And this man didn't go through banking. He, he created, he was involved with the creation of the Sovereign Bank, and today he's in the creation of another great bank, Customers Bank. I'm happy to have Jay Sidhu here today. Hey, thank you, Michael. <laughs> Who are you talking about? <laughs> uh, so, so let's, let's talk about your mom and dad. Your, your dad was in the military, right? Uh, yeah, my dad was a colonel in the army and uh, sort of a self-made man, and he was one of the the only member of his family, uh, the rest of his family were all farmers. And your mother's side? They, my they, mother's they were the physician's side, yeah, right? Yeah, my mom's side was all doctors. And, uh, you know, in the traditional Indian uh, uh, culture, you know, it's the boys are given an opportunity to study and the women are given an opportunity to find good married people to marry. So my mom ended up not being a physician, but I'll tell you what, she has the brains of a physician. So your mother didn't become a physician, but your father became a... A colonel, right? Uh, yeah, he was an army of army officer. Now you told me there was a story that happened in 1947 on the on the train that he, you know, you might have not been born. Uh, I was not. <laughs> right, but you wouldn't have been born if what happened on the incident. So tell me about that. You know, uh, Aptabad, That's the city. Now it's on the global map because that's where Osama bin Laden was killed by the United States uh, uh, Marines. And uh, that's where my dad was a second lieutenant in the army and when he got married with my mom. And the first time he took my mom home was to that city in that cantonment because India and Pakistan were together at that time and that happened to be a military base. So this was August the 14th, 1947, the day India and Pakistan split up and, and on religious grounds. And my dad, not being a, a Muslim, uh, was asked to leave and he with a couple of other uh, officers were on a train with my mom being the only woman over there and the train before trains before them and the trains after them were slaughtered not a single person alive and my mom and dad made it through obviously he did have a gun with him and a couple of other things but still 
that's not it's 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 luck it's fate it's you're fate. absolutely right i wouldn't be you wouldn't be <laughs> here. <laughs> wouldn't be there so so you said when you were growing up you you moved like nine times right uh, over because of your your father's military job yeah uh we're two brothers and one sister and my older brother my dad and mom decided to put him in a boarding school and mommy wanted the younger one with him all the time so i ended up moving with mom and dad and my dad being an army officer and uh, moved to nine different places and i moved to nine different schools with them and stayed with them uh, till eventually my dad got transferred to a place where there was no schooling and it was what they called a field station in other words family cannot be there because you are right in front at the chinese border <laughs> that's where so yes, I went to nine different schools before I graduated from high school. So you 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 graduate from high school, and because of your mother's side of the family, uh, always expecting a physician, uh, you try to take the route of pre med, right? And that uh, that wasn't the uh, appropriate market for yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's how it was because that was the background of the of the family. So. So my father was up there in the front so-called field station at the Chinese border and my mom was there and it was obvious that uh, you got to become a doctor or join the army. And so I got to this college of, for a pre-med program and they were using all these words I'd never heard before and I'm not one of those who memorizes things. I'm one of those who always wants to understand what's behind this. And, and I was blown away. I said, this is not for me. So but I didn't know what else to do, so I was just thinking about Army, and I saw see an ad in the paper for the very first bachelor's in business management program ever in India. And I sent a telegram to my dad, you know, left pre-med, joining business school. Now, but you, as you said to me, there, you, there were a lot of applications and limited amount of uh, positions available, right? There were... Oh yeah, it was a very competitive program, it's the very first one. There were thousands of applications and we were like a couple of three, two, three hundred kids less, two, less than two, about two hundred kids who were admitted. And we had to take a written exam, a group interview and such, uh, and, and then you had to give a, a, a speech, spontaneous, and that was the selection process. And uh, so it was over a two day period. And I was very fortunate, you know. That so what's the name of the school that you originally went to? Uh, it's the, called the School of Management at Banaras Hindu University. Now, one thing that you liked when you were growing up is when you were going to college is that you, would, you were very involved with the, with the Rotary, right? Talk about the Rotary because that has a big impact on your, your life and your future uh, and also speaking engagements and then how you took $90 and came back with $100 later on in the summer. I'd like to know that. And then the $75 ticket uh, <laughs> sale. <laughs> well, uh, when I was uh, in uh, freshman in, uh, in uh, college, so they had uh, uh, Interact is the version of Rotary in schools and Rotaract is the version of Rotary in colleges. And I loved their motto, service before self. And you'd also see Rotary Exchange students where they were talking about encouraging the youth to go out and travel, understand other cultures, mingle, and, and, and try to really understand and promote peace and, uh, and giving and culture through interaction. So that's why I was very attracted to the Rotary. And so when I was in college, I ran into these couple of kids uh, and, and at our campus, so also we are, had this University of Wisconsin Center, so the American kids would uh, go around. But anyway, this was a special couple. And they were Australians, uh, Britishers going to Australia and through this. And I said, if they can, and then they talked about this thing. I said, my God, if they could start off in England and go to Australia and promote this world peace, it sounds like, you know, but they had the money. I didn't have any money. And at that time in India, when you left the country, you were given eight dollars so you're out of luck you better have money otherwise you can't travel so and i've read about the rotary exchange students and whatnot so i am so so thankful to rotary that i had i just set up this dream 
I don't know how we were going to do it, that I want to be among those first Indian students who travels from India, promoting world peace through understanding and service before self and trying to tell them that there is youth in India also that does the same thing that you see from the Western uh, youth. So we took an opposite track, leaving Delhi and going to London with ma eight boxes, all I knew I could have. But I somehow managed to take a little bit more than that. And then I coming think you back. took about 80 yeah, and then, and then you're right. And then came back and all the time, you know, surviving and but you said you survived. You were reading palms. I mean, you were doing a variety of. Uh, how are you surviving a number of weeks in in, in London in the UK with eighty dollars? And then, as we said, you came back with ninety dollars. Michael, the best education I've ever had in my life was those three and a half months of hitchhiking from Delhi to London and back, and having all those experiences that you were talking about because it taught me not just survival, but it taught me the basic, uh, basic meaning of life. Okay, and I'll tell you how, as an example, the hot spot of, of the world right now, one of the hot spots is called the city of Kandahar in Afghanistan. That was the first place I touched foot on the ground outside of India ever in my life was Kandahar, okay, because I couldn't go through Pakistan, okay? So uh, my dad was able to buy me, mom and dad were able to buy me a ticket. So we land in Kandahar, and the very first day I had a knife pulled where somebody tried to steal my $80 on my very first day. How do you survive, and how do you do this? Okay, that is an education itself. And then, you know, instantaneous, because you, right. never, you can, uh, can't plan for that. Right, nothing's planned. Nothing planned for that, you know, but it's, it's, it's instincts. And, and you cannot just cry, you know, you've got to deal with it and plan on and move forward. And, and that was an adversity on the very first day of your adventure. And you could easily turn around and go back, but that was even out of question. It's like, how do we take the next step? So the bottom line is, you're so right. My mom and dad had to put up about $250 of Indian rupees for the $80, $90 I was able to get, along with a letter of introduction to Rotary clubs around Europe and Asia. But it was a great experience. Great experience, along with the Prime Minister of India at that time was Indira Gandhi. And my classmate, his dad was a member of the parliament. So through that, I got a connection to see the Prime Minister of India, and that was, she was the one who helped me get 80, 90 dollars. Okay, I keep saying 80, 90 because I got 80, eight, eight, eight I would have gotten anyway, you know, so. Right. <laughs> and, and we hitchhiked from Kandahar through with tremendous amount of adventures and experiences. And when somebody is telling you, you know, I'll feed you if you read my palm and you are from India, and I had no darn idea how the hell to read a palm, but you, Think about it, because at one time I had read an article about palmistry, and you move on, you know, and you make, you do whatever it takes well, then, to survive. You graduate college, and then how do you decide to come to America to try to, uh, to go for a master's? I always had a dream, and that was that I believed that the best country in the world is the United States of America. Every kid knows it. The day that I'll never forget in my life was the day President Kennedy got shot. In India, we were moved by that. So my brother was a, was a student at University of Michigan anyway, and he had a similar dream. And he got over here, and I said, I would like to go to U.S. and make something and be successful over here. And so that trip that I, we just were just talking about was an adventure to try to achieve your objective of because I was still a student. I was a, I was a sophomore between my sophomore year and my senior year, junior year is when I did that. And to come to United States, I had no money. M Colonel in the Indian Army is middle class. So I sent, I wrote a letter with my passion of why you should admit me. And I sent letters to 80 universities in United States saying why they ought to look at me even though I'm not submitting any application fee because I couldn't afford to. 
and and that's how I got to the United States because there was a university, there was a fantastic one university called Wilkes University, in where Wilkes. where there is the Sidhu uh, Business School today. That is correct, okay. Sidhu School of Business and Leadership. Okay, so you, you get to Wilkes Barre, Pennsylvania. What year is this? Year year is 1971. You had no idea what Wilkes Barre, Pennsylvania. I was. had no darned idea. I didn't. I was used to call it Wilkes Barre. And and I don't even know how to and pronounce and it. And, and what happens is something with the Salvation Army, uh, the homeless shelter, is that uh, the first day when you arrived because you, the dorms weren't open yet? The first time I touched the United States was at Kennedy Airport, and it was National Airlines had a flight where I had to get off. And I get to National, and I get to Wilkes Barre, I get to National, they say there is no f reservation for you. And here I am with my bags full of books because I thought I would save money by buying them cheap and trying to figure out which ones do they need. So anyway, so I get to Philadelphia. Somewhere I'll find a way. At that, at that time, they used to have the stewardesses seats were, not, were also could be given to, to passengers. So I get to Philadelphia, and I spend a night over there at my cousin's house. And, and, and next day is, my, is Labor Day. And, and the school was starting two days after Labor Day. So here, I don't know what the hell was a Labor Day. So I said, let me get there a day or two earlier. So I'd get on a Greyhound bus, I land in this public square, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. I asked someone where is Wilkes University, and they said this way, left and right, and I go, and I see a sign of Wilkes, and I knock on every door, and all I see are the doors locked. And then I go to the administrative offices, and there is a real lock over there. And here I am, it's an evening, I have no idea, I don't want to spend any money, and so I asked, told someone where I was, and they said, you know, there is a, there is a YMCA here. Now that I knew very easily, and, and that turned out to be the homeless shelter of the YMCA, which is right next to Wilkes campus. So my very first night on my, by myself in US, first two nights actually, were at the homeless shelter in Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. You go to graduate school, and when you graduate, it was another one of our recessions, and there weren't too many jobs. And really, there were, th there were two jobs. One was you could sell life insurance, or you could have been a working for Sylvania, right? Yes. S Sylvania, what was the job? A financial analyst, financial. correct. What happens one day with the dean coming into you and telling you about this banker friend of his? Yeah, Dr. Warner was the dean of uh, College of Commerce, is what he used to call what, and uh, so he mentioned to me, he said, you know, I was at a board, board of trustees meeting and the chairman of the board of trustees, Reese Jones, is a banker. And he asked me to recommend somebody to him and I recommended you. So I said, Dr. Warner, I already have a job and it's with Sylvania. And he says, oh, well, I didn't know that, but please do me a favor. You got to go see him. He's the chairman of the board of trustees of our university also. So I was driving on the highway, and he told me it was in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I was driving down the highway, and I see the sign, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I had no idea. I wasn't p properly dressed, but I did have a Wilkes. You had a Wilkes uh, Wilkes sweatshirt. sweatshirt on, you know. So I, I found a way somewhere out to this bank uh, and found a way where everybody thought, I must know this president of the bank, and I got to him, and to make a long story short, he tells me, uh, I want to hire you. I said, Mr. Jones, I already have a job. And so he said, pay you $500 more than what you're getting. I said, you have a deal. Right, and you, <laughs> were, the, and you were the first management trainee, right? Yes, first management. And, and you met one of your long-term friends, Dick East. My very first friend outside of my student life was Dick East, and he is my best friend, and I'm so lucky that we are working together. So you, he had a lot to do with me being there because he... Reese Jones checked me out, and Dick w was the one who basically said, you got to hire him. So you're spending a number of years at, the, at that bank. Then you get married at this time, yep. and then a headhunter calls you, tells you about a job in uh, Morristown or Morristown? Morristown. Morristown, Mor New Jersey, with a bank called Horizon Bank, which subsequently was acquired by Chemical, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. So tell me about what happens. Yeah, so uh, Reese Jones, who was my mentor and Dick East, you know, who, uh, Reese Jones unfortunately died. So I started thinking, what is it? But anyway, I was doing fine. And, uh, and I wanted to get to move, move on. And I, and the 
the culture of the company changed when the CEO changed from Reese Jones to this new gentleman, John Howell. And uh, so I got this opportunity, like you said, uh, uh, in Morristown, New Jersey, and uh, I drove over there and uh, saw them. I had never, ever been, and to, to this day, I've never really looked for a job. You know, it's always like somebody says, I want you to do this and go around ahead. And uh, so they said, you know, uh, we were trying to, uh, to, to build a bank, grow this bank, and, uh, and would you be willing to work in business banking, consumer banking, and marketing? And, and so I took it, and, and I ended up working with, with, the, with some very different but growth-oriented, innovative people. And uh, it was a great time because innovation in banking at that time meant you make things like home equity loans and credit cards and debit cards and something different than just a six-month CD. That was called innovation in banking, and right. those are the things now, that we did. Now, another thing that changes your life is you, you, you take a program at Dartmouth, right? And you're sitting next to another banker who says you have to be creative, right? Or yes. So I was always into taking advantage. Learning, to me, is the most important thing in life. So every time I, there was an opportunity, to, 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 there was a conference or there was a seminar, so at Dartmouth was putting together strategic planning for banking at, in, in Hanover at, at Dartmouth. And so I went there and I was sitting in a bar and I, this gentleman sitting next to me and while we were having beer, we got into this discussion and he's talking about, he was a financial genius, but I n understand of course finance with, the, with an MBA and whatnot. But so he said, we got into this discussion of what are the, the secrets to success in business because we were both at a strategic planning. And I said, it's all about people and, and customers. And he was talking about it's all about financial engineering. Anyway, we got into this discussion. It was actually a pretty heated discussion. And a month or two later, I get this call from my former colleague. You know, he reached out to me at, at this bank where I used to be at saying, Paul Wien, you know, who ran into you, he wants to see you because he wants to hire you. And he asked me to, to, to find a way to convince me that I should accept uh, his invitation to go visit him. So I ended up, to make another long story short, I ended up seeing him, you know, at this place in Pennsylvania, and it was back in Bucks County, and he was running a bank called Bucks County Bank. And he convinced me, and he did it. Actually, I was expecting a job interview, and it turned out to be it was a sales job by him. Like, I'm not going to let you go back till you start working for me. So what year is this, and what is the title of the, the job? Uh, it was the Chief Operating Officer, Divisional Coordinator of Bucks County Bank, and I was 20, late 20s and or so. And uh, it was, I think, in, I think it was 1983. So how long does that last before you change to the next place? So Paul Wind uh, ends up, uh, you know, not being at this bank where he recruited me, but he was recruited by a bank called Penn Savings Bank. And he, when he was recruited there, he came to me, he says, I'll accept it, provided you make a commitment, you're going right, to so follow. You, so you join him, right? So I join him, and this Penn Savings Bank is today sovereign. sovereign. Right, but, but what's interesting about Penn Savings, because you had been creative with the innovative products when you were at Horizon and then following, but Penn Savings was a small bank, but it was during the, the period of times that the banks were having difficulties. You had to raise capital, which was something that you hadn't really done you know, with Alex Brown. And what you also did was very involved with acquisitions of growing a bank. Because when you joined this Penn Savings, what were they, a billion dollar bank? 450 million in assets and had bad loans, which were two times their capital. That's so it was a brain dead bank and I didn't know anything about it. Other than it was more like, hey listen, if it can be humanly turned around, we will turn it around. And if it's humanly possible to build it, we will build it. And that's all I knew when I joined Penn Savings Bank. How do you get to become the president of Penn Savings. So anyway, Penn Savings was a failing bank, and we saw this opportunity, turned it, so the way to fix it, we realized is that you gotta work on every single loan and fix it, and at the same time, you gotta come up with a strategy. And they had 
11 or 14 branches, which, which we found out half of them were unprofitable and not capable. So we had to shrink pen savings. And then the strategy was either you're going to have to build or you're dead. You know, and to sh you have to have a story to raise capital. So, and, and this company was starving to raise capital. So we put together a five-year strategic plan. And fortunately, Alex Brown, like you said, and Roger Powell, who still is a friend of mine, you know, and, and from Alex Brown. And uh, we did business together at Customers with him. So we put together a strategy that we will do mortgages, which are variable rate, to well-qualified people, and we will raise deposits Okay, at the same time, so we will manage risks and we will never, ever accept Right, and problems. you follow the, the concept of the Golden West where the, the, the husband and wife family had done this and you were trying to strategically follow that and during the period of time you made like 15 acquisitions? About 15 acquisitions Fif and uh, made uh, 10 times money for our shareholders. Right, and then you create Sovereign Bank out, out of this and in order to make Sovereign Bank even better, you find the people in Spain. How does that happen? It wasn't that easy. You know, it was over a period of time. So we first, uh, you asked me how did I become president. So in 1989, the board came to me and said, you know, we like, we like your strategy, like the way, you're, the way you're seeing things and do you see a future? And my feeling was always, you got to have a strategy in place and you got to be clear about it and then take that into goals and then have a, have, have a what we call alignment, which means the board and the management and every team member should know where we are heading. Mm. And you got to look at the external environment. You got to look at the internal environment and be authentic about it, brutally honest about what your strengths and capabilities are. So we realized over there that our strengths and capabilities were basically at that time in, initially in mortgage lending. But we knew that you couldn't continue with that yeah. forever. So, so commercial a... banking was there. So like you said, we did some acquisitions to get to a certain size, become a very profitable company, be able to attract. Then we said commercial banking, is it? Right. So we got into commercial banking. Then we said a geography. With one minute left, you left Sovereign in 2006, correct? And in 2006, you went into the consulting business, private equity business. You, you take over this other bank, another failing bank in Pennsylvania, and from a quarter of a billion dollar bank, today customers bank is a four billion dollar bank. At Sovereign, using the different strategy, we made 23% average annual compounded returns for our shareholders. We saw an opportunity in today's environment to create a bank which businesses would say, wow, consumers would say, wow, and the younger people would say, it's about time, unbelievable. Okay, we've done that. Younger people, how many children do you have? We have two children. You ha and their names? You have Sam, okay, Sam, Sidhu, Sam. Sam Sidhu, he's in the private equity business, and Lovleen Sidhu, and she's in the consulting business. And you've been married to? Married to Sherry for 36 years. Any grandchildren? No. Not yet, okay. Yeah. But I'd like to say the guy from New Delhi who, whose father was fortunate that he got on the right train, I'm very proud that, and happy you were here today. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Michael.